So this is problem F6-1 from Hibbler's textbook, uh, version 14. And in this problem, we're going to look at the method of joints. In this problem, we have a simple truss system with four joints connected to a roller at A and a hinge at C. A force of 450 pounds acts on joint D in the negative x direction. Now with just this information and the knowledge that the system is in equilibrium, can we determine all the forces in each of the individual bars in the joint? That is, can we determine the force acting on AD, on AB, on BC, and on CD, and on BD? The answer is yes. However, it's not really that straightforward. We can apply the equations of equilibrium to find the reactions at the hinge and roller, but the equations of equilibrium won't really help us find the forces at the individual members. For this, we have to turn to the method of joints. The method of joints consists of taking free body diagrams at each of the individual joints in order to find the tensile or compressive forces at each joint from each member. So let's start this problem. In a problem such as this, we first want to eliminate as many unknowns as we can. Right now we only have one known force F of 450 pounds. However, we also have the knowledge that a hinge provides a reaction in the X and in the Y direction, and a roller, in this case, will provide reactions in the Y direction. So we need to first find those reactions at the roller and also at the hinge. We can find those reactions by applying the equations of equilibrium. In this case, we could start by trying out the sum of forces in the X direction. In the X direction, we will have no reaction from the roller because the roller will not provide a reaction in the X direction, but we will have a force of 450 pounds. The force acts in the negative X direction, so we'll give it a negative value. We also have a reaction from the hinge in the X direction. Now, just from observing this diagram, we know that the force at the hinge will be in the positive X direction. Applying the equations of equilibrium gives us a value of the reaction at the hinge in the X direction of 450 pounds. So we found the force of the hinge. We could try to take the sum of forces in the Y direction, but you'll notice that we will end up with two unknowns, AY and CY. So that may not be the best equation to use. If we take a sum of moments, however, we could find a way of reducing our equation to only one unknown. In this case, it doesn't really matter if I take my sum of moments about the A or the C joint because they will both end up with only one unknown. But I will try to take the C joint so that I can find my reaction force at A first. So what forces cause a moment about point C? We know that we have a given force of 450 pounds acting at a distance of 4 feet from joint C. Remember that distance is measured from the joint to the line of action of the force. Because this force causes a counterclockwise rotation about point C, the force will result in a positive moment. Now if we need a moment to counteract this, since the sum of moments need to be equal to zero, then it's safe to say that the reaction force in the A joint will be in this direction. We see that this force acts at a distance of 8 feet from joint C. Because the moment that this force A will cause will be in the counter in the clockwise direction, we can give this moment a negative sign. The sum of moments about any point in a static system has to equal zero. And now we have one equation with one unknown, so we can solve for AY. In this case, AY will be equal to 450 pounds times 4 feet divided by 8 feet or just 225 pounds. 
So we found our force on A1. Now we can apply our sum of forces in the y direction in order to find our reaction force on hinge C in the y direction. In the y direction, we have our force AY of 225 pounds, and we know that in order for this system to be in equilibrium, my reaction force at the hinge has to be pointing towards the negative direction. This should be an easy equation to solve, where the reaction force at the hinge, CY, is equal to 225 pounds. Notice that we already drew our arrow pointing in the negative direction, so there's no need to add a negative sign here. However, in order to not confuse these reactions, let's draw the directions of the force. So we found our reactions at both hinges. However, that's not really what the problem asks us to do. We want to find, instead, the forces at each of the members of this truss. Now that we know the reactions at the hinges, we can use this to find the forces at each member of the truss. We will do this by using the method of joints. In order to start the method of the joint that we may be able to solve by applying the equations of equilibrium to it. In this case, we may pick A, C, or D as our starting point. We can also pick B as our starting point. However, this will result in two unknown forces. So even if we start with B, we will still have to turn to another hinge before returning back to B in order to solve it. Because I want to solve things more or less in order, I'd like to start with joint A. I can start analyzing joint A by taking a free body diagram about the joint and looking at all the forces acting on that joint. First, I can look at my external forces. I have my reaction force from the hinge, AY. And we know that that force has a magnitude of 225 pounds. We will also have either a tensile or compressive force that comes from member AD and either a tensile or compressive force from member AB. Sometimes we can figure out the direction of these forces by simply looking at the diagram. Here we have a 225 pound force pointing upwards which means that force AD should be pointing towards the joint. This also means that force AB will be pointing away from the joint. However, in order to have more of a standard set or standard procedure, I'm going to start by assuming that the forces from my members are tensile forces. What this means is that if I ever get a negative value for my member forces, then that means the force is in compression. This will be especially useful when it comes to analyzing internal forces in the future. So now that I've drawn my free body diagram and I've applied all the forces that are acting on joint A, I can now use the equations of equilibrium. Because we already have a known value in the y direction, I'm going to start with the sum of forces in the y direction. In the y direction, I have a positive force of 225 pounds. I also have the y component of this force AD. From the diagram, we see that joint AD moves one horizontal unit for every one vertical unit. That means that the angle is 45 degrees and the slope is 1 to 1 to root 2. The vertical component of force AD will then be the magnitude of the total force multiplied by the sine which is equal to the opposite sine of 1 over the hypotenuse of root 2. Because we are pointing this force in tension, then we need to take the force to be a positive value. Those are all my forces in the y direction, and this should be equal to zero. Now I only have one unknown, force AD, and I can solve for that unknown. In this case, my unknown force AD will be equal to negative 225 pounds multiplied by square root of 2. 
This is roughly 318 pounds. The negative sign tells us that this force is in compression. Therefore, I can write this as 318 pounds in compression. For this problem, I'm going to try to keep my forces in terms of their roots, at least until the end of the problem, because this will simplify my calculations for the other joints. So, so far, we have a force AD of 318 pounds in compression. Let's write it down so that we don't forget. Now that I finished with joint A in the y direction and found force AB, I can take my forces in the x direction to find force AB. In the x direction, I will have my x component of force AB. I know that the x component will be equal to the magnitude of the force multiplied by the cosine of the angle. In this case, the magnitude of my force is 318 pounds in compression. Because it is in compression, I will give it a ne negative value. However, remember that I also wanted to be sure to express this in terms of its slope. So instead of writing 318 pounds, I can instead write 225 pounds multiplied by square root of 2. Now this is the total magnitude of the force. Because we only care about the x component, we need to multiply this magnitude by the slope, which is equal to the cosine of the angle. In this case, the cosine of the angle is equal to the adjacent side, 1, over its hypotenuse of the slope, root 2. And I hope that now you notice why I want to keep everything in terms of the slope. Here, root 2 can cancel out easily, leaving us an x component of the force AB of 200, negative 225 pounds. I also have my force AB, which is pointing in the positive x direction. Solving for this gives us a force AB of simply 225 pounds. Because this is a positive value, that means that our force, AB, is in tension. Now this is what we were expecting. We were expecting force AD to be a compressive force and force AB to be a tensile force. However, I would prefer that we keep the procedure of assuming tensile forces and simply setting our negative values as compressive forces. So we found two different forces, force AD and force AB. Let's write them down so we don't forget. Now we finished with joint A. And there's nothing else we can figure out from this joint. So we can move on to the next joint. Let's go with joint B. For joint B, we will have a force in the member AB. We already found that force. Force in member AB was 225 pounds in tension. Because each of these members in the truss are two force members, that means that the force will be the same throughout the entire member. What that means is that at force AB, we also have a force of 225 pounds in tension at joint B. We will also have our unknown forces BD and BC. We don't know where these forces are acting, so we're going to assume that they are in tension. In this case, it's very easy to figure out what the force in member BD is. If we were to take a sum of forces along the y direction, we would have only our force BD. And we know that the sum of forces has to equal 0, which tells us that force BD is equal to 0. This means that throughout member BD, there is no tensile nor compressive force. This is typically called a zero force member, so we will mark it as such. From a statics perspective, if this were rigid bodies, which is what we're analyzing, then there is really not much difference in this element if we take out member BD. 
However, in future lessons, you will see why it's important to have them. Now that we've found force BD, we can apply the sum of forces in the x direction to find force BC. And this should also be relatively simple. We have a force of negative 225 pounds and an unknown force BC acting in the positive x direction. This means that our force BC is simply 225 pounds. It is a positive value, that means that our force is in tension. So we assume the direction correctly and we found the magnitude, so now we can write it down. I hope that this gives you a couple of ideas on what to do when you are dealing with a similar joint situation. If our joint has two collinear members and one third member perpendicular, then the third member will be a zero force member. This is assuming that no external forces are acting on our joint. So if you ever have a system of forces where the free body diagram gives you a T-shape, then you should know that the perpendicular force will be zero and the two collinear forces will be equal to negative the magnitude of each other. We finished with joint B. Now we can move on to joint C. Here we only have one unknown force, so that should be easy to find, as all of other forces have already been resolved. In this case, it doesn't matter if we start with the x or y direction, so I will just start with the x direction. In the x direction, we have a force of negative 225 pounds. Now don't be confused. If our answer turns out to be negative, then that means our forces are in compression. But once we know the direction of the force and we apply it, the positive and negative signs will correspond to the force acting on the positive or negative x direction. So even though this force is a tensile force, it still carries a negative sign because it acts in the negative x direction. We have a 450, 450 pound in the positive x direction, and then we have the x component for force CD acting in the negative x direction. Because the angle of member CD is similar to the angle of member AD, the slope is still 1 over square root of 2. With only one unknown, we can easily solve for force CD. We will get that force CD is equal to negative 225 pounds plus 450 pounds multiplied by the square root of 2. Because our answer had a positive value, we know that this force is acting in tension. So we found all of our forces now, and let's write them down. We had five elements, and we found five forces. So as of this point, our problem is done. Now what happens with joint D? See, if we would have started with joint D, we would still have found all of the forces before getting to the last joint. We can use joint D now as a way to check our answers. But that really isn't necessary because we know that the answers are correct. However, if you are working on a problem and you're not sure if you've got the right value, try solving that last remaining joint. This will give you an idea of whether your answers were correct or not.